So, thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Good. I like to move around when I talk. Um, it keeps me awake and hopefully helps keep you awake as well. Uh, it is such a delight to be here at SLU um, to see a number of dear old friends. Uh, although SLU, I was explaining to Malin from, from um, the, um, Future or Global, SLU Global, uh, I, is, I, I know of you and your fantastic reputation. I've, I've lectured here a couple of times, but it's not an institution that I know very well. Uh, and uh, the work that you do um, focus so much on agricultural issues and food. Uh, that's an issue I care a lot about, but not where I necessarily have expertise. Uh, although I, I did give the keynote speech to the American Society of Agronomy last year. And I warned them that I didn't know anything about agronomy, but they said, that's fine. We like the way you give speeches. So um, if you get bored with the SDGs, I can pull that speech out and talk about the future of agriculture uh, from a layman's perspective. My purpose today is to give you some information about what's happening at the global scale on sustainable development, and particularly how it is being focused in the work uh, around the United Nations, which then spreads out to the world, uh, uh, having to do with this, this set of goals called the Sustainable Development Goals, which are part of a larger process called the Post-2015 Development Agenda. Um, it uh, can get very sort of burdensome with the language around the, the United Nations and sustainable development, as you see. But my purpose today is to give you a kind of walking tour through what's actually happening. And then for those of you who are staying for the discussion, then we will dig into that and sort of what, and ask questions like, what does this mean for SLU, for Sweden, for uh, how, do we, how do we turn this uh, set of... Um, uh, set of goals and this process that's coming out of the global dialogue into something concrete and real here that's new, that's additive, that's uh, got, got a, a different sense of, 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 of even history about it, because that's what's happening. What we're witnessing with the change from the SDGs, from the MDGs to the SDGs, which I'll s explain more about in a minute, is, and I truly think this, nothing less than a kind of a historic turning point in the way the world conceptualizes these issues and tries to implement them. And that's a big statement, uh, but I'm not the only one making it. I've heard many colleagues at the UN say the same thing, for example. Uh, but I'll try to make that case and then open it up for discussion. By the way, please feel free to raise a hand and interrupt me at any moment. Uh, if you're not following something or you're strenuously objecting to something uh, that I'm saying. Um, uh, thanks to Jan for that nice introduction, and I'll just, I'll, just, uh, I'll just add, just for your information, that working on these issues, the SDGs and the UN, that's about one-third of my time. Uh, the other third, I'm a strategic consultant to corporations working on sustainable development strategy, CSR, corporate responsibility issues. Uh, and then the other third, I'm working with think tanks and NGOs and governments on what people call the science policy interface. You know, where do we... How do we take the findings from scientific research and turn them into economic policy that works? Uh, and um, uh, that's a big fascination for me, and that's one of the reasons I love to come to institutions like this, to have these kinds of dialogues, because that dialogue between research, science, and decision-making is, in my mind, one of the most critical things that we're still learning how to do as a species on planet Earth. Yeah. So let's get into it. Um, the, uh, the SDGs. Uh, the SDGs, SDG stands for Sustainable Development Goal, and I'm going to say that phrase a lot, grows out of the MDGs, which were the Millennium Development Goals, and I'm going to tell you that whole story in a second. It all comes out of here, and in fact, uh, I'll, be, I'll be there next week um, at the United Nations headquarters. The, uh, the, the process of creating the SDGs is um, a UN process, and what does that mean? It means that the nations of the world, represented by their governments, are talking. Uh, and as many of you are probably very familiar with, they, they've been talking for a long time about sustainable development. Uh, and in that building and in the, the places around it, there's an awfully strange, and I mentioned this before, language, and I thought I would just kind of show you what I mean by that language. So now we're going to do a little quiz. Rio plus 20, if you know what these things mean, raise your hand. Rio plus 20, you know what that is. Okay, so for those of you who don't, that's the uh, UN Conference on Sustainable Development that happened in Rio de Janeiro 
in, 19, in 2012, 20 years after the first such conference in 1992. Rio plus 20. How about open working group? This is why I'm here, because this is <laughs> these are not things that you are able to spend time reading about on the internet, probably. So it's easier when someone tells you. Um, the open working group is a set of countries selected out by the UN who drafted the sustainable development goals, 30 of them. But they knew that only even 30 countries are not representative, so they had little clusters of countries and took turns negotiating. Uh, and now I won't test you on the rest of them. High-level high level political forum is the new body that's been created by the UN in order to manage this process. And what's high-level about it is that sustainable development used to live in the environment ministries. Uh, and with that Rio Plus 20 meeting, it got a big upgrade. And so now, sustainable development is an integrated concept that prime ministers and planning ministries and finance ministries have to deal with. So that's what high level means. It's gotten up to a higher level politically. The rest of it is just to show you that this kind of language is so special. Um, you know, the third tranche is a budgeting term. You don't really need to know it. I'm just, again, signaling that to come into that world requires learning a new language. Uh, and a lot of things are happening. That QCPR sounds very small and bureaucratic. What it stands for is Quadrennial Comprehensive Policy Review. And every four years, the UN gets together, the countries at the General Assembly level, take a look at all their development processes and rethink it. It's huge. And when it does, when it happens, it sends an enormous signal out to the rest of the UN system. Uh, you must be more efficient this way. You must integrate that way. You must focus on these priorities in a different way. And these come out as resolutions from the UN General Assembly, and everybody has to jump. Uh, so that's what's going on um, at the UN level in this kind of, in this kind of a context. Now, why is it happening? Why is anybody even caring about these letters, the MDG, SDG, et cetera? Well, that's because of this, the MDGs. The MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, were enormously considered, considered enormously successful. It was an effort, and, an, and this was not a largely consultative effort. This was a small number of people in a room back in late 1990s, year 2000, saying, wow, this is an unwieldy agenda. Let's simplify it. Uh, and so the Millennium Development Goals in connection with the Millennium Develop um, a Declaration were born. And you can see that it's simple enough you can put it on one slide and it's no more complicated than a telephone number and, and everybody loved that about them. Uh, underneath them were <laughs> targets, were specific targets. Um, you know, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger was, hunger was you know, joined with a specific target about having poverty in a certain period of time, for example. Uh, and uh, people uh, who work in the field were, I think, so astonished themselves at just how powerful this was to the point where budgets got reorganized. Governments reorganized their uh, policies and sometimes even their minist ministries around, around this. A lot of aid money uh, ended up being strongly affected by this goal set. And the fact that it did that and that it was considered pretty successful you know, the official poverty rate got halved since 1990. Equality in primary education was achieved, more or less. Not every country, but on average in the world. It's quite to everybody's delight. Uh, significant gains in maternal and child health. Uh, access to water, improved housing. Uh, so a lot of successes uh, in the MDGs, reaching some of the goals. Then a lot that weren't achieved, and that's called the unfinished business. And I'll say more about that in a second. But it was this sort of perceived success of this process of setting goals, putting targets with them, making it something you can grasp instead of more platitudinous, uh, amorphous sayings um, that grabbed everybody's attention. And it's the reason why uh, at um, the Rio Plus 20 conference, people got more interested. Now, we used to report on the MDGs, our progress. It used to look like this, where you know green, red, yellow. Are we on track? Are we going to meet this goal, not meet that other goal? Uh, that evolved over time. So even simpler ways of reporting. This is the most recent and probably almost the last. There'll probably be a final report on our progress on the MDGs. Uh, but um, uh, this, the reason I'm showing you this is because this, these are the things that we're going to be doing in the next 15 years around this new concept called the SDGs. We'll be seeing similar reports. We'll be seeing posters. We'll be seeing communications campaigns. Uh, and that's why I'm here, and I hope that you're here, because that language of the MDGs was so powerful, the SDGs are gonna have an even bigger campaign behind them, you might say. Uh, and that's going to be a song that we're all dancing to, to some degree, 
uh, in research and policy formation. Uh, it, people will be relating to it uh, at the government level, at the institution level, around the world. And they'll be doing things like this, sort of showing progress. So um, let's talk about the process of, of getting to this thing called the SDGs. And then I'm going to be so boring as to actually walk you through them, the, the 17 of them. But the process is important, understanding where it came from. Uh, this slide alone could result in a several hours interesting academic seminar. And that's the evolution of the concept of development, its relationship to sustainable development, and how that got expressed in, um, in policy terms. So you know, the notion of general economic development progress in the poor world uh, had its own stream. And I would be so bold as to say that it was completely separated out from the sustainable development dialogue. And you saw that bureaucratically because development happened in the finance ministries, or agriculture ministries, or planning ministries. And sustainable development happened in the environment ministries. Uh, and they almost had nothing to do with each other in, in most cases um, around the world. Real budget decisions were made over here, and then repair and, and, and you know, efforts to kind of do things a little better and green it were happening over, over there to make things simple. What happened was Rio plus 20, where the countries got together and said, you know what, this isn't working. We have to integrate these things. Uh, sustainable development really is about everything. It's about the environment, but it's about economic prosperity for the poor, and it's about social justice. And these, three, these things should not be in separate, separate kind of streams. You can also see it in the other more bureaucratically looking things, like the QCPR. You can see it in the drive within the UN to create more unity. There's a process called One UN, where, uh, where people should deliver as one. You shouldn't be competing UNDP, the development program, against UN environment program um, so, you know, for the same thing. You should be working together. So a lot of that was going on and resulted in this concept of let's have SDGs. That was a big decision. And it led to a big process. There's the general timeline, um, and some of you may be familiar with it, but we're looking at something that really stretches back to well, even before 92 to 87 with the framing of concepts, lots of meetings, even back to 72 in Stockholm in the first um, UN meeting on the um, uh, human uh, environment uh, that happened in, in this country. Uh, and it's still happening now. Um, it resulted first, though, in this draft, and, and, and by the way, the, the, the UN strong point isn't always graphic design. Uh, so the first draft of the SDGs looked like that. Uh, and it was a big moment when it got released. Everybody just you know, grabs it and reads it and, and gets very excited, even though it's like the worst looking document you can imagine. Um, it gets better, don't worry. Uh, what they did was the SDGs covered all the unfinished business of the Millennium Development Goals and then added the rest of the sustainable development agenda, in a nutshell. Uh, and the process of negotiating it was really quite remarkable. So first you had Rio Plus 20, and you had this open working group that I mentioned of country representatives who were negotiating among themselves. And then you had a whole lot of scientists and different kinds of experts, uh, different, the major groups, that's another piece of UN speech, the major groups, these are codified into the UN uh, 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 formal documents as nine groups, including industry, women, farmers. And when you go to a UN meeting, sometimes you'll see like, you know, you'll see the, the countries and then you'll see the major groups. And there's one guy from Colombia and he's farmers, you know, all the world's <laughs> farmers. <laughs> and, and usually taking turns with other representatives of other agriculturally based NGOs to sit there and talk about the needs of farmers. It's quite a remarkable system. Uh, so they, they were all negotiating among themselves for a year and a half a year and a half, uh, and I was way in the background of that. Uh, a friend of mine was the chief science advisor to the chair of the open working group. Uh, and so he had a little circle around him that he would send sort of emergency emails out to us and say, help me with some more argumentation about why climate change should be a goal. <laughs> For example, that really happened. Uh, climate change was one of the things that almost fell off the list of real goals and had to be fought for to get it back on. Mm -hmm. Really interesting process. When I said the science policy dialogue is really important, I really meant it. Because that's where you see it, it happen. You've got scientists sitting around, you know, chair people, and they're also listening to the polit political leaders, and they're fighting it out. You know, do we take science seriously or not? No politics is more important here than science. Whew, wow, that's interesting, because you know, in my understanding of how nature works, nature always trumps you know, human decision making, but that's another story. But that really went on. The draft emerged that I showed you. And what's going on right now is that draft is being 
let's say, let's call it renegotiated. So the final decision that will happen in September. Now, everybody hopes it won't be renegotiated. And in fact, the developing countries, so-called, have been incredibly insistent that no one should tamper with the results of that negotiation, negotiation, the draft SDGs, which you'll see in a minute, because that was an incredibly delicate political balance. And if you tamper with it, the whole thing could unravel. Yeah. I'll come back to that. But that's where we are. Next week in New York is the next in a series of monthly meetings leading up to September where these national representatives come together and look at different aspects of the SDG draft that was produced, uh, which also had some input from the Secretary General, et cetera, um, and try to figure out if they're going to make a final decision about it. People were concerned that there were 17 goals in the draft. That was too many. Remember the eight that I showed you earlier? David Cameron, Prime Minister of the UK, was on a war path saying, 17 is too many, no more than 10. Why? Because nobody can remember more than 10 things. I thought, in the age of Google, we have to care about how many things people remembered? Uh, I didn't like his argumentation, but I'm not somebody with you know, power and influence in that, in that kind of situation. In any case, it was, it was a fought battle whether we should go down from 17 to 12 or 10. But the Secretary General came out with his recommendation and he didn't touch the 17. He said, well, let's just put a little extra little symbol around it uh, of six clusters of themes that, that we can, when we want to communicate these issues, it'll be easier. So if you want to dig into the details there, you can look at the, I call it the rosette. I think it's a pretty little symbol for sustainable development. Okay, we're almost into the meat of what we're talking about here. But the process is ongoing and the graphic design has gotten better, as you see. Uh, and it's going to be decided soon. And there are the goals. How many people have seen these 17 goals before? Raise your hand. Okay, mm, roughly half. Uh, now, I could leave that slide on the screen for half an hour so that you can read it, or I could give you a walking tour uh, through them, and that's what I propose to do. Uh, I'm gonna go quickly, but I'm gonna go goal by goal so you get a sense of the whole. So goal one is poverty. And we need to remember when we're thinking about these issues that the eradication of poverty is essentially a kind of a cornerstone of the entire international dialogue that we're talking about. It's the thing that keeps everybody together in the UN context, my opinion. Uh, so it's always number one on the list. Uh, and uh, end poverty, eradicate, you know, this is, this is, these are big words, but these are things that people really are working for and we really are making great progress toward. Anybody who's seen Hans Rosling's uh, lectures knows that we've actually made pretty pretty good progress on this goal. Um, and now, along the way, I'm going to show you not all the 169 targets that are under each of the set, that are under the total of 17 goals. Every goal has targets. Now, the language is a little confusing because it's unclear what's a target, what's an indicator, what's a sort of sub-goal. In many cases, these targets are something more like sub-goals. Uh, and a st strategic planner like me gets really irritated with the way they use language sometimes, but that doesn't matter. You have 169 things that feed into the top line things, uh, of which there are 17 of them. And I'm showing you in the slides one or two as a sample of what is underneath each goal, what it means really. So eradicating poverty means um, getting everybody up over $1.25 a day. That's what it means in UN terms. Um, okay, and uh, there's a lot of other things under each goal and I'll tell you a little bit about that too, but we're gonna go quick. So two is hunger, so poverty, hunger. And you now we're right into your field of interest, shall we say. Uh, end hunger by 2030, big goal. So I'm gonna take a pause out of this tour and say, as I'm going through this tour of the goals, think to yourself what this means. This is all the countries of the world in a three-year process of negotiation where they said, we're gonna make you know, an agreement about this, and they're coming to agreement for the first time about a comprehensive set of goals that everybody should try to achieve as a world. That, let that sink in for a minute. That has not happened before. This is as big or bigger as the, than the Declaration on Human Rights in the 50s. It's a huge potential moment with lots of caveats, worries, you know, <laughs> Uh, along the way, but as you look at these goals, keep that in mind that this is what we're talking about. You know, that, that every country has signed up for this already. Yeah? They've already passed it as a resolution in the UN. They're just trying not to tinker too much with it to get to the final summit meeting in September. 
Three, healthy lives for all. And uh, here it's, it's about health and it's not just about maternal health, although that remains from the MDG sort of language, but also it's about everybody's well-being, physical health. And again, and I'm going to introduce this word for the first time, you'll see it again later. The, one of the key issues here is that the difference between the MDGs and the SDGs is that this is no longer about the developing countries. This is about everybody. The word is universality. These goals do not just apply to our efforts in the North to help their problems in the South. This is about Sweden. This is about the middle-income countries of Latin America. This is about Russia, the United States, and China. This is about, and of course, it's about all the other countries that have been struggling to get everybody up over $1.25 a day. It's about everybody, yeah? So um, this is about health for everybody, including us at the end of our lives and the beginnings of them. Uh, including a lot of specific stuff. Look, even traffic accidents is in here. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm actually working on a project to improve road safety in Kuwait at the moment. You can ask me about that later. But <laughs> that's a big issue there. People die from traffic accidents a lot in lots of parts of the world because they don't even wear seatbelts yet. Yeah? All right, so this is the country that invented seatbelts. Did you know that, yeah. Sweden? Yeah. Goal four, education. Learning, and again, it's lifelong learning. It's not just elementary school for everybody. Goal five, gender equality. Uh, and you can just scan there. It's trying to deal with all the issues around gender, including violence, uh, including um, forced marriage, genital mutilation. You know, Again, as I, as I go through this, remember that the world has signed up for this. Quite an astonishing thing. Six. Ensure availability and management of water and sanitation uh, for everybody. There's uh, target 6.6, .6, water-related ecosystems, mountains, forests, wetlands, rivers, aquifers, lakes. Whew, everything's there. <coughs> Seven, access to affordable, sustainable, modern energy. Uh, and you'll notice, and I put a question at the bottom, that not all these goals were created equal. Yeah, than the targets underneath them. There's variation, and we'll get to that variation, especially from a scientific perspective, in a minute. So by 2030, we're gonna double energy efficiency. Well, why only that, and where did that goal come from? Why, who, who is that anchored in any kind of scientific analysis about what we need to achieve climate? No, probably not, yeah. Uh, it was a negotiated political understanding. I don't know the details of each individual target, but I'm guessing, actually, so don't quote me on that. But I don't know for sure that that's anchored in any particular scientific analysis. Strongly, anyway. Uh, economic growth and employment. So here we understand that we're not just talking about the green stuff. We're talking about the big picture. And somehow we need sustainability and eco ecosystem sustainability, but we need economic growth as well, especially for those who need to get up over 125 a day while saving the climate and everything else. Infrastructure and industrialization. You can imagine if you are a typical environment ministry type person working on sustainable development, and this comes up on the table, it's a bit of a sort of mind bender. But all of those who, of us who, walk, who work in developing countries know that this is a critical need. You know, better, in, better infrastructure is essential for them to have better trade, to improve their technologies. I mean, it all hangs together as a, stem, as a system. And now I come to my second key word, and that is integration. That what you're seeing also is the world's attempt in the complicated and often bureaucratic world of the United Nations to drive a sense of systems integration into the way we think about development. That's interesting. And systems thinking, systems processes, even systems modeling, and I'm an old systems guy, that's where, I'm one of, one of my, that's where I got educated, you might say. Um, uh, I've never seen this much system stuff coming into the process before. This is a new thing, including uh, interesting modeling techniques and such. Just to give you a sense of this, <laughs> this is a set of posters that somebody made to illustrate the, illustrate the goal. So, so um, you know, that's not what I usually think of when I think of sustainable development, but that's a personal opinion. <laughs> but, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, there are other parts of the world where this is what they're, they're dreaming of. So it's like, how do you do this and do the green stuff and the social stuff at the same time? 10, inequality, big issue. And it's not just for everybody else, but also us here in Sweden. You may know that this country is the country whose trend towards inequality is the fastest in the world at the moment. We're considered one of the most equal societies, but we're becoming less equal faster than uh, any other country. Interesting. Will we respond to this call for SDG number 10? And how will we do that? 
Think about that some more. Goal 11, cities. Cities were the result of a concerted international campaign to get the idea of sustainable cities on the list of goals. 200 institutions, mayors, et cetera, who worked really hard. Uh, and I know the guy who chaired that campaign. So you know they, they worked really hard to get this on the list. And that was what the SDG process was like. A lot of people working hard to get their interests into that finally negotiated document. 12, consumption and production patterns. We're reinventing the global economy, basically. This is where companies show up, for example. 13, climate. I told you the story about how that almost didn't make it. It's there, but it mostly says, take a look at Paris later. That's what this is about. You know, it doesn't try to go into the details of climate negotiating at all. It just notes that it is a goal, and these, these goals are essentially related to the other negotiating process. The oceans. Uh, this is another campaign area, and it's an area where I, my, I and my firm work. One of our clients is WWF. We're working on uh, the blue economy. Uh, and if you've never heard the phrase blue economy, anybody here heard the phrase blue economy? A few of you, good, okay, yeah. It's growing so fast. These are all the countries, and the ones in blue are the ones that have a blue economy declaration or a program or initiative of some kind. This is the, the economy of the sea. And how do, you, how do you make it much more prosperous and profitable while keeping it sustainable? This is a huge side topic, but it shows up in the SDGs without using that phrase. Yeah? So this is really an omnibus, the SDGs. It's kind of gathering everything. 15, ecosystems. There's a traditional environmental concern. And 16, peace, justice, fairness, violence, bribery, corruption. And finally, uh, number 17, the means of implementation, another piece of UN speak, meaning, okay, who's gonna pay for this? How are we gonna train everybody so they can do it? What's gonna be the institutional framework that allows it to happen? All of that. There are three important meetings happening this year. One is this one, the one about this in September. There's one in December or in November in Paris on climate. There's also the Financing for Development Summit, which is gonna be a major decision-making process around how the money flows on development issues. And there are some of the issues they're, they're dealing with. So this is really hard to keep in your head all at once, as David Cameron kept reminding us. So I tend to just sort of summarize it this way. Um, and, and, and if you're intending to learn them by memory, and some people claim that we should, and I probably ought to, but I haven't yet, uh, this is one way to do it, kind of tag it to some keywords about what's happening. So those are the 17 goals. And before I tell you about the implementation side and then try to leave some time for questions, any comments or questions about the actual goals? Yes, I no. have one problem that you addressed that I would like to hear how it was discussed, and that's that there are these trade-offs among the goals. And how were they discussed during this uh, phase of actually formulating them? They were discussed, and, and the systemic linkages were discussed. And in fact, that's, the question, that's discussion question number one for after, uh, after we're from finished with the, the, the lecture portions, is for us to dig into that. Because I, I, I think that the systemic part of that agenda is going to be left to all the rest of us to figure out how to solve. Okay. Hmm. Good question. All right, it, shall I go on? You still awake? I think maybe you need to be woken up. So I thought I'd sing you a song. Is that okay? Yeah, so a lot of what's happening around sustainable development is happening because we haven't really figured out what to do around growth. We want more of it, but it, a lot of it destroys things that we care about and that we actually have to have, right? So, but growth is happening, and it's happening exponentially. Who knows what that means? Exponential <laughs> growth. Okay, good. I'll test you. What's the, what's the, uh, what's the minimum <coughs> annual percentage rate that results in exponential growth curves? Minimum percentage rate. Annual. Come on, your researchers. Is it 10%, 2%, 50? What, what is it that generates one of those curves that goes like that, exponential growth? Thank you, Jan. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. A lot of people have a hard time getting this, but any percentage growth rate turns, turns, you know, any positive growth rate in percentage terms turns into one of those curves. And that's really hard to remember. 2% population growth means shoom, right? So in order to help people get that really clear, I wrote a little song called Exponential Growth, and I'm gonna sing it for you, if that's okay. Here's. A song that's meant to warn you or enlighten you or both. It's a little complicated, but you really need to know. There's a dangerous phenomenon, I swear to you, an oath, that there's trouble in this world because of exponential growth. That's your part. 
exponential growth. Oh, exponential growth. You can run, but you can't hide from all the exponential growth. Oh, exponential growth. Look out for Yes, it's creeping up behind you. Yes, it's exponential growth. A rate of 2% per year may sound like things are going sloth. But that's really very fast, as my example soon will show. There's six billion people now. Wait a minute, I wrote the song 10 years ago. There's seven billion people now. There'll be 14 a phonic growth in just 35 more years because of exponential growth. Here we go. Exponential growth. Oh, exponential growth. Well, you can run, but you can't hide from all the exponential growth. Oh, exponential growth. Look out for Yes, it's creeping up behind you. Yes, it's exponential growth. Now if I sing along on one note and I slowly raise the pitch, I can demonstrate the process note. Just when I make a switch, seems like nothing much is happening. It's just a little rise, but the changes come much faster and you're suddenly up to your eyes and all the exponential growth. Oh, exponential growth. You can run, but you can't hide from all the exponential growth. Oh, exponential growth. Look out for Yes, it's creeping up behind you. Yes, it's exponential growth. Now to reinforce the message of this song I have composed. Here's another demonstration of just why this is the most subtle danger that we face if we just let the world coast. We'll go faster, 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 thanks to exponential growth. Here we go. Exponential growth. Oh, exponential growth. You can run, but you can hide from all the exponential growth. Exponential growth. Exponential growth. Exponential growth. So you did wake up, yes. But we scared one person away. Don't worry, there's no more songs. I was. <laughs> I actually wasn't planning to do this, but I conferred with a few people, and they said you could take it. When I'm usually, usually when I'm doing anything connected with the UN, I don't usually pull my musical side out of, out. But uh, this is, you can you can assume that I was just demonstrating for you what I do for other groups or something. <laughs> so, uh, a question that I wanted to just leave on the board for a second, uh, and we don't, we're not going to answer it now, but we can we're going to dig into questions like this. But can you imagine sitting there in the negotiating process, and you know? David Cameron wins, and others who are voicing the same opinion. And you've got to cut this list of 17 things down to 10. What do you do? What does that mean? How does it work? Could you do it? And then we get into the issues around systemic linkage and everything else. So it's just more of a thought experiment. I'm not going to pause and do dialogue around it yet, but kind of have that in the back of your mind. What does this mean? The countries are insistent that this 17 list, it's it. We're not going to tamper with it. But you know, people are still kind of maneuvering around in the background. Trying to, trying to change things. We'll see. OK. So the scientific world came, weighed in and said, well, there are some problems here. And you can read this report if you get very interested in this topic. Um, uh, ICSU, the International Council of Scientific Unions, or actually just called the International Council of Science these days, um, did a report and said, these aren't great, basically. Uh, from a scientific analytical perspective, they're not great. They're, not well grounded. They need more work. They're weak. They're not. You know, they're duplicative. They're you know they're problematic. Well, that's this is the this is the proof that that what we're looking at is a political product, not a scientific product. Yeah. Um, okay, implementation. So what's going to happen? And I'll go quickly here. Countries are going to be expected to create some kind of implementation plan around this for themselves, and do it, and then report back to the UN about that. That's one of the things that I'm working on. Um, in my job as a consultant to the UN, to the UN uh, is helping the UN plan for this thing where countries will have to report about what they're doing, they'll have to implement it in their national plans, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So, but the UN, so it may be important to know what the UN's role is in general in this kind of a context. The UN is like the world's, I sometimes think of it, and it maybe unfairly, as the world's largest NGO. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big organization that isn't a government, but that has the mission of reminding people about important things. So that reminding function, they call it the normative work in the UN world, normative. It means you, countries, agreed to do this. Our job is to remind you that you agreed to do this. Don't forget, human rights, uh, climate change. You, know, that's, you agreed to that, got to implement it. And then we'll help. We'll provide you with some resources. We'll facilitate. We'll get meetings together. We'll get the governments talking. We'll do training programs, everything we can think of to help you do what you agreed you were going to do. And that's everything from 
you all agreed to calculate the GDP and report on that, that too. You, you all agreed to try to save the world's natural systems. It's all there. Uh, there's the UN system, and there's the tiny piece of it that I actually work in, uh, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, where the Division for Sustainable Development is, also statistics, macroeconomic policy, social policy. The policy shop is, is the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, and um, they, in turn, have responsibility for thinking through a lot of the, 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 uh, the policy side of what the UN's going to do in relationship to this, in partnership with UNDP, which is an implementing agency, UN you know, Environment Program, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's a complicated world, that UN world. So I'm going to simplify it again and just focus your attention on these three things and tell you one case study and then stop. So what's, and this is the third word that I wanted to bring up, and that's transformation. So what's really remarkable to me as someone who's been working in the field for a long time and uh, you know, my, my teachers and mentors were always thinking and writing and talking about systems thinking, integration. Uh, they were thinking and talking about uh, transformative processes uh, and how this needs to apply to everybody. And that's all now basic UN language. That is all written into the document structures in the last three years. The Secretary General of the United Nations when his synthesis report and all this was all about transformation, integration, universality. We've got to make a big change. We've got to do it with a lot of systemic, integrative understanding and policy making, working across boundaries we haven't worked across before. And it's everybody's got to do it. It's not just a subset. This is a huge thing. Um, so how is this actually happening? Well, the UN's going to be producing a global sustainable development report. I recommend that you download the current prototype. It's not a formal one. It's a kind of preliminary example of what it might look like, but it's very interesting. Uh, and it has lots of interesting data, like this one. <laughs> you know, uh, this, is this is scholarly articles in, in internet databases, and they're mentioning of various topics. Uh, you, can see the, um, you can see the impact of the financial crisis in this graph, among other things. But you can also see that, uh, you know, goodness, sustainable development, which was on its way out, suddenly had a huge spike, along with lots of other topics having to do with sustainability. Um, there are a few other, I'm going to skip some of this data because it's not so interesting. Th actually, this is the same data in map form. This is the number of countries that previously were reporting to the UN on, on their sustainable development work. Do you notice any pattern in which countries are reporting and which countries are not reporting? Hmm? It's pretty clear. Yeah? So this is what I mean by universality. We have to switch from this map where basically the countries that are worried about playing the aid money game so that they can get the, you know, meet the requirements of their, of their mostly northern donors, but that we shift to a model where we're all thinking the same way and we're all reporting in to this central body about whether or not we're making progress towards these universal goals or not. Um, we're moving towards more systems thinking. Don't worry about the words here. What this is showing is across one axis, I think it's um, the, yeah, the top. The, uh, the top axis is the goals that we were setting. This was prior, prior to the actual SDGs. The, the left axis is the actual global trends. What are we doing? So this is what we're doing, and this is what we say we want to do, and the red bits mean we're not doing it, right? <laughs> They're not hooked up. Our, our actions and our intentions are not systemically well linked. That's what this graph is telling you in simple terms. So, and then the UN's working with pilot countries, six, maybe seven of them. Um, I've been working with one of them in Belize, small country, Central America, 350,000 people. Um, and, um, but it doesn't make it any less complicated because it's small. In fact, it makes it more complicated because Minister X, you know, used to go to school with Minister Y and they didn't, if they threw food at each other back then and they're still throwing food at each other, that kind of stuff. That didn't really happen. That's just an illustrative <laughs> anecdote. But it is a complicated world there. Um, but what's interesting about it is that since it is small, you can move uh, and support them in making changes that they want to move. They raised their hand and said, we want to be a pilot country. We want to try integrated sustainable development. Uh, and uh, by the way, when I go to Belize, people in Sweden assume that I'm going snorkeling, <laughs> that I'm enjoying their fantastic coral reefs and the beautiful architecture from the Mayan period and everything else. No, this is what I'm doing. I'm going, I have never even seen the beach in Belize. <laughs> I just go to the government buildings and, and meet with the, the ministries of finance and planning and environment and everything else. And in those, in, and in those buildings, uh, we were all working together to develop a, a new way of thinking about sustainable development planning in that country. They used to have a growth and poverty reduction strategy, like I was saying at the beginning of this lecture, where all the economic decisions were being made. Then they had a sustainable development strategy, which was a little greener, et cetera. Uh, and to make a long story short, they're now merged. 
Sustainable development has moved out, is moving out of the Ministry of Environment, which is called Fish, Forestry, Fisheries, and Sustainable Development, and moving into the Ministry of Finance and Economic Development. And new interministerial working groups are being formed. A new monitoring framework has been developed. A new prioritization framework has been developed. If you've got limited funds, and you've got to choose 10 of these 20 policies to implement, which one do you do? Well, the idea now is you do the one that actually generates the most integrative, transformative impact. That doesn't cause trade-offs, like, we like Jan was asking about earlier. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it has, these are the features I was saying about earlier. Integrated policy framework, implementation plan, moving things around. That's that information. And, and symbols and pictures and frameworks that communicate that to the policymakers in the country. So this is already on the table for the ministers to, uh, there in that country to approve sometime in the next month or two, we're hoping. And it's actually already spreading through the Caribbean, and it's meant that this model will spread through the UN's capacity development programs to other countries. Uh, a new, a different way of thinking about how to do integrated sustainable development planning. So that's the kind of thing that's happening in concrete terms. All right, to close off, so what's my main message here? My main message here is that this thing called the SDGs is coming. It'll be final and firm by September. It'll be officially launched in January. When it comes, it will have an enormous impact on the policy frameworks, the funding mechanisms, uh, and very likely rippling out to you the research uh, funding pots of money that are available in some time, not tomorrow, but over time. Uh, and more importantly, though, it'll affect, it can affect worldview. It can affect worldview. Uh, it can help to create a more, uh, more of a sense that we're all in this together. Uh, it depends on how well it's taken up, how strongly people grab it. I mean, you know, in the usual developing countries, it's already being grabbed. Uganda is already working with this, for example. Ethiopia, Vietnam. Um, in Sweden, not so much yet, <laughs> can, one can state. Uh, and we'll get to that. And there are certainly challenges around it, not least resolving the internal goal conflicts that Jan very uh, cleverly pointed out early on as one of the issues they would they have to think about. How do you get infrastructure development and preserve ecosystems at the same time? Finding the means of implementation. And then for me, what's really crucial and, and links most to uh, a university's agenda, and that is how do we build the capacity uh, to achieve these goals? How do we make sure that we know what we need to know uh, in order to do it? One of my other UN projects, for example, now is surveying how partnerships, multi-stakeholder partnerships, share knowledge and information so that, you know, so, so that knowledge spreads more quickly around the world about how to implement this stuff. And that was my lecture. So I wanted to just leave this slide. These are the, the kind of things that I often can, if you, don't, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have a question in mind but you want to ask a question, you can pick something off the wall. <laughs> um, but that's the end of my formal story about the SDGs and then we can go into some Q&A discussion now and then we'll have a, a longer discussion after one.